George is the really the recognized international expert on therapeutic communities. He's traveled all over the world. He has uh, helped so many people, both through his research, which established the credibility and efficacy of the model that we use, and then as a mentor and teacher going around all over the world to help people start effective therapeutic communities. And it's a blessing to have him as a friend uh, and to have him as uh, someone who uh, comes here and shares his uh, wisdom with us uh, periodically. As well as my angst. <laughs> as well as his angst, okay. So, George DeLeon. Well, of course, thank you, Rod, and uh, Scott, for your, uh, some of your inspiring words. You're in a long tradition of people who have uh, discovered the power of uh, therapeutic community, not necessarily as patients or clients and that, but people who have observed it, as I did in the very first days when they were forming as a psychologist coming into some of the first programs in New York, a place called Phoenix House in New York, and um, seeing for myself something that no psychologist often gets to see, which is not simply people uh, removing their symptoms or their pain, but transforming their lives. And when you, when you see that, you begin to get a perspective on what is possible, as I did, and with, great, with, with great good fortune, that people can not only feel better in life, but they can transform their lives. But what was doing it was the, the central and compelling question about that. What was it about the therapeutic community that seemed to have this particular set of ingredients that could essentially help people transform themselves? So that was the, post, that, that was the psychological and the science side of mine, of my experience in this. And I kind of dedicated myself to that question. I knew that the, something profound was occurring from Synanon on, on, and that this particular approach was going to have to be carefully studied, carefully advertised from the scientific point of view, if it was going to endure. And I have to tell you that we've had high moments in the evolution of the endurance of the therapeutic communities and low moments. Uh, we're coming out of a low moment now, and that's one of the reasons I came here this week, not only for myself as why I come, but also to, and when I heard uh, again that maybe Amity was going to have its board meeting and move forward, I thought this might be a target point to talk about uh, a springboard for going forward. Given the evolution of the therapeutic community, it's high moments programs like Amity, high moments, low moments. So uh, let me put a semicolon on That's a quick and an ad lib introduction to what, what I really wanted to say in terms of two or three key points. You need to know that um, a, a very simple statement. If you go back to 1960, 1958, for the disorganized and, uh, and troubled populations that we all are talking about, but particularly drug addiction, there was no treatment for, for drug addiction. That is, there was no effective treatments. Uh, it's a simple fact, you need some of the simple history on this, so that when the pharmacological treatments were being an experimentation like methadone, there were essentially uh, only the arise of what we now call therapeutic communities, which were essentially developed by the recovering people themselves. So this was not an approach that was cultivated in the universities or the medical centers or by professional psychiatrists or psychologists. The whole approach was developed by the individuals themselves. So when you finally kind of reframe that, you say, well, basically, communities were being developed by people themselves to help themselves change. Now that's a profound point, you know, both in terms of, let's say, the history of mental health, medicine, or in any sociological history. Here you have people themselves on the margins of life finding ways to change themselves because the mainstream society couldn't do that. I got in on the front door on that in, uh, in, uh, in those early days, seeing that, and saying, well, what we now have is the first example of, in, uh, in certainly in urban settings, where programs like this were developing it was coming right out of the people, and there was a kind of methodology that was evolving from the people's daily 24-7 interactional experience. They were creating a methodology, although they didn't call it that, of course. They had none of the classical scientific and academic terminology to that. 
Well, I knew then it would have to be, as I mentioned earlier, we'd have to demonstrate the success of this because the classic society, you know, the, the medical and medicine society were, were essentially the ones in charge, but they were not really producing any, any successful outcomes. So when you began to see programs like this, beginning to talk about people changing, we didn't use the word remarkably, we didn't use the word recovery so much in the early days. It all had to do about, you know, changing lives and maybe being rehabilitated people who once were habilitated but then lost their lives through drug addiction, that's rehabilitation, versus habilitation, people who never had a positive lifestyle to begin with, so that you're now talking about uh, two important related tasks and two kind of subpopulations, those who've lost their lives and those who never acquired one. And so therapeutic communities becoming centers of teaching people how to live namely go back to the way you can live right or learn how to live right for the first time. Well, how do you essentially convert that into a classical funded treatment modality? And therapeutic communities essentially, when they began to say they wanted to move into the mainstream, first ones weren't funded from the mainstream, but they wanted to move into the mainstream, collect essentially uh, government money to do what they're doing, you had to then meet all of the perceptual requirements and criteria of the mainstream. And that simply required certainly data and, and uh, demonstrating what changes and how it changes. So look, the conclusion from this part of this point is you need to know even as rel relatively lay people what the effectiveness of the therapeutic community is. That, that, that model has been. And it's the story I tell, I tell it everywhere, and I'm telling it again here today, which is when you, in fact, begin to follow individuals who've gone through therapeutic communities, places like Amity, places like Donovan when the therapeutic community was in the prison, but when you follow them through treatment and follow them post-treatment, you find a very lawful outcome. People who have, in fact, completed the whole process, you, you see success rates, and usually by success we mean no crime, no drugs, and pro-social behavior, going to school, paying taxes, raising their children, all of those indices together in some profile of success. Success rates of 70 and 80 percent. Five years, 10 years, 12 years later. Now, when we first reported findings like that, uh, beginning already in 1968 and 69, and not with government-funded research at that, at that time. I had local foundation research. When we began to report some of those early studies on that, they were so striking, they looked like essentially fabricated numbers, particularly with the most damaged populations, the highest severity uh, damaged profiles. So this wasn't simply middle class and upper middle class addicts who got into trouble, into serious acute trouble, and then entered some kind of a hospital setting. These were people whose lifetime problems were, up, were evident. And here we're looking one, two, five, and 12 years later and seeing these outcomes. Well, it, though, uh, needless to say, those findings were challenged. And for a period of time, it's, it's another conversation, but for a period of time, uh, the therapeutic community research findings were always under challenge from some of the mainstream uh, medical and mental health centers. Uh, because largely, and they had some good arguments in terms of, well, these weren't typically randomized controlled studies and so on, but because they were long-term observational follow-ups of people over, over the years. But gradually, we made the case. Other researchers demonstrated the same effects. The National Institute on Drug Abuse began to fund our research, and other investigators uh, began to show the same findings. So here's, here's the point. If they finished a long-term program, two years, 70, 80 percent successful, but the most of them didn't finish. So if you look at dropouts, which is what we did, over 500 of them, and essentially ask the question, what happens to dropout? You get this lawful outcome, and you need to know it simply as part of your education. The longer the individual stayed in treatment, the better they did. Success, it was kind of almost like a dose response function. Uh, those who had stayed 12 months showed 60% success rate. Those who stayed nine months showed 40% success rate, and so on. So we knew we had something lawful, 
We knew, of course, ideally we want people to move through the whole process because that optimizes their outcome. Every resident has to hear this, and I always give this lecture to every resident also. But in, even if you don't finish, it doesn't mean nothing has changed. And you have to essentially, as you, the longer you stay, the better you do. That law, as a matter of fact, is now is lawful for all drug treatments, uh, as it turns out. The longer you're in the treatment, the better you do. Now, given that, therapeutic communities in its evolution, in places like Amity, have began to be very successful and we had a period of some 20 or 25 years where this modality, which was a non-medical modality, a social modality of some sort, uh, was getting regular funding. Long-term treatment was obvious. And for some 20 years, we were okay with that. We were getting enough support to do that. It's another story, sociological story, to talk about how the erosion of that has started to occur, which is my second point. We began to see over time that uh, some of the effects of treatment were not as impressive. We began to see over time as policy and money situations began to dominate the thinking, there was a inclination to move towards shorter and shorter treatments. They didn't want to fund so much time. Uh, and so you, you see this paradoxical effect of a very successful modality and then some decline in that for a variety of external and internal reasons. Again, it's another story, but the message you have to understand is that we have gotten to the point, this is noticed not only in community-based treatment, but in prison-based treatments, uh, that this evolution of the sort that I just described to you was occurring. Now, it's at this point that I think we come to today. We now have a kind of a, a, a little bit of a blip up, and, and that is there seems to be now some realization of the importance of not only uh, therapeutic communities as an approach, but maybe the investment in longer term treatment, uh, keeping people in the process long enough so that they can change. But the, the only really bright lights on that are like Amity. Most of the other therapeutic communities, this is not advertisement now, so just, just pay attention. Most of the other therapeutic communities who essentially moved into the mainstream made the adjustment to the mainstream. Mainstream said, keep it shorter, you know what I mean? Make it three months, make it four months, and we'll cover you. And so the, they, what they did, those, those organizations were essentially preserving themselves as organizations rather than preserving a treatment. And so the issue here was, as these, uh, the funding situation changed, most of the therapeutic communities, and there are many, they, they made a good adjustment to that, but it was an adjustment essentially, uh, which was not at all consistent with what the actual treatment approach required. And this is one of the crises, the evolutionary crises that I've been kind of lamenting about uh, for a few years. We now see a little bit of a change. Uh, and Amity itself remains as the kind of um, a solid bright light on what the treatment approach, what this whole community approach really is, and why it has to go a certain period of time, and and we begin and both in prisons and certainly in, in community-based settings. So this is one of the reasons, of course, I stay deep, deeply attached to not only Rod and I as individuals, but to the whole approach, because we're still holding on and essentially to the fidelity of this approach. So now, here's what I'd like to make a suggestion to you about. Given this, this, these two points, a very, very profoundly effective approach, if it is properly implemented, profoundly effective, given the fact that social policy continually challenges it so that it can essentially begin slipping, and now with those two facts, and knowing that what keeps it going is the word fidelity, what you do, how you do it, why you do it, you have to do it in the right way. That may include also how much time the individual is in the process. Given that, you say, what is it gonna be going forward? If it's gonna be continual challenges with social policy that inadvertently simply can contribute to the undermining of the approach, how do we go forward? So, of course, my strategy is first, well, keep educating, keep educating. So I, one of the reasons I'm talking to you about this, give you some kind of basic historical facts around this. We can go forward now in two exciting ways, both of which have already been essentially piloted 
by Amity. And again, not an advertisement. From my point of view, I'm interested in the entire field, even though my, I kind of have a personal love for Amity. It's the entire field that I'm interested in. And the two strategies are, we're dealing with the most severe populations. That we cannot forget. That's the first point that has to be made. We're not simply talking about drug treatment. There are, there are now existing effective drug treatments for certain populations of clients. With the expansion of and the enculturation of drug use in, in, the, in the United States, every level of society is affected by that. And you have, you have various kinds of treatment modalities that can, can treat them. But no modality other than the therapeutic community has been able to serve the most severe, the most troubled population. Many of them need habilitation as well as rehabilitation. In short, the TC and places like Amity is the treatment of choice for that profile. So going forward, the first statement that always has to be underscored in any ambitious project, whether it's we're going to get funding, whether we're going to try and change funding policy, it has to begin with the scientific statement that this approach is effective. There are other treatment effective approaches, but this, this treatment approach is effective for the most severe populations. In fact, it's the treatment of choice. The second point, no treatment is effective if it's not implemented properly. So there has to be continual focus on the fidelity, being faithful to the principles and practices and underlying assumptions of the model. That's what the word fidelity means. No treatment can be effective without being a high fidelity treatment. Amity is the closest to representing that, but we always talk about what may still need to be changed, what we still have to be do better, what's slipping in staff, what's slipping in residents, how do we implement all the activities in the right way. So that's a training issue. And when I come to that, I'm saying the future of Amity and the future of the field is going to essentially depend upon this issue of fidelity. And so if that's so, I have this fantasy that I've shared with Rod and others. Amity should really, because of its endurance and its enlightenment, essentially begin seeing itself as a possible center of excellence. Uh, that this is a place because we've been able to hold on. It's not that it's, it's not perfect here, but because we've been able to hold on now and show the meaning of community as a method, this should probably be one of the places where it should declare itself as a center of excellence, be willing to develop the capability and resources for helping the field train itself again in this way. So that's one of the fantasies that I, I would hope the board would consider. I got five minutes. The second, the second implication going forward. Also, Amity has essentially been piloting. We now know this whole issue of how long you stay in treatment and is it too costly and so on, even though cost benefit studies in TC show them to be very cost beneficial. One way we can approach this is to begin to rework combinations of residential treatment and, and moving outside of residential treatment into continuous approaches. People talk about continuative care, aftercare. I don't want to use that language at the moment. Because what has to change, if you're dealing with certainly populations of the sort we're talking about, and there is a concern about dollars, that means efficiency, you can talk about issues of developing new systems. And it's, it's a systems approach that Amity has been already piloting. When you talk about Dragonfire, you talk about any of the, the next steps out, whether you're going into some kind of a, another setting. There's a way of building recovery-oriented, integrated systems. Some of the pilot work already done on that. So I'm, my hope, part of my fantasy is that two, two outcomes that the board would consider in its own imagination, which is, could we begin thinking about recovery-oriented systems, and could we begin thinking about centers of excellence? Thanks.